This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program in America that you, the viewer, can express your concerns, tell your stories on the child welfare system or the family court system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and next to me is Maria Malin. Maria? Domestic Violence Awareness Month evolved from the Day of Unity held in October 1981. This was conceived by the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. The intent was to connect advocates all across the nation who were working to end violence against women and their children. Today we're going to dedicate a program to domestic violence and domestic violence awareness. Well, Maria, as we get ready for this program here, I think that the best person to really Tell us a little bit about domestic violence would be you. You've advocated for several years on this. How, how long have you been going at this? Well, Dennis, it was originally in 1998 when I experienced domestic violence for myself. I had never been in that type of situation. I don't believe that I even knew anybody who had. The only thing that I knew about domestic violence is that it always gets worse. Um, you know, we, I spent some time trying not to admit I had been victimized. It doesn't matter how strong or independent. Domestic violence doesn't care about how much money you make, what your nationality is, what your ethnic background is. It strikes everywhere. Um, there's always women who are in that situation and who really don't know how to get out. I had started working in it in 1998 and I started with just the knowledge that it always gets worse, um, does not get better. There's a lot of people all over who will tell you, who will be the first to get up to a woman and say, you need to leave. And we've heard it from Oprah Winfrey, Dr. Phil, I mean, you name it, anybody out there that is dealing with domestic violence is going to tell the victim that they need to get out. This is great, but when the woman actually does get out, many of the courts are giving the abusers custody. 58,000 children per year are going into the homes of convicted abusers with unsupervised vis visitation and custody. Um, my domestic violence was he was convicted. There was no question that it took place. But the court still refused to help women and children in these situations, and they placed the children in harm's way. We have kids dying from abuse, and we have di kids dying from suicide. And the numbers are staggering how many of these children are being harmed either by the abusive parent or by their own hands. Um, these are losses that don't need to take place. These are, this does not need to happen. You know, you can tell a woman to leave and that's great and that's wonderful, but where's the assistance and the legal help to help the victims out? Originally, legal aid was set up to help women of domestic violence, but the problem is, is that the courts, in an effort to keep the money flowing, they allow the feuding to keep going. And many of the times, 
you know, the fathers that are seeking custody, sole custody of the children and trying to take the children out of the mother's lives are abusive. And in turn, they're trying to pay the mom back for leaving them and trying, attempting to get themselves and their children safe. What needs to happen is that we all need to band together and until everybody gets furious and until everybody realizes that this is affecting all of our children, there's not going to be any, we're not going to be able to implement change. One of the things about domestic violence, it doesn't just stop in the home. I know some people like to think that it takes place behind closed doors, but when this little child Mary goes into her classroom, studies show that her grades and her behavior are going to be subpar compared to a child that's not living in abuse. So despite if you realize it or not, this young girl, and, and we're talking about thousands of classrooms, this is taking place in all across the world. This is not just a few isolated cases. It's everywhere. This is directly affecting your children. Um, the behavior outbursts, the attention issues are going to harm your child's ability to be able to learn in the way that they deserve to. So now that we know what the problem is, we need to really figure out ways to correct this, to get judges rather than putting these children with convicted abusers, they need to protect these children from convicted abusers. They need to take these children, and, and rather than putting a domestic violence victim on supervised visits with their children, they should put the abuser on supervised visitation. Now, I know this sounds crazy, and I know it's very hard to believe, but this too is happening every day. I know thousands of women that have been placed on um, placed on um, supervised visits and they had never been accused of abuse or neglect. So this is a real issue with our courts today and this is something we have to do. You know, we have to really get in there and we have to do something about it. I have a lot of moms who have advocated and experts that have worked in this field for a long time as myself and you would be surprised if you dig into the finances of all of it. There is something called the Fatherhood Initiative Funding that helps fathers gain custody and rights to their children. Now, originally, I personally and strongly believe that this was needed when it was set up. Um, fathers were getting the raw end of the deal in courts. However, this has done a 360 and now it's it's difficult because one of the things about domestic violence is good moms don't want to take children away from good dads and good dads don't want to take children away from good moms they are able to collectively figure out a schedule that works for both of them and in much of the time the fathers are very active in children's lives where the problem lies is that the people who are utilizing this funding is abusers is you know the the father that wants to control the mother and take her completely out of the children's lives now we here at silent voices 100 percent support good dads we're all for non-abusive fathers and we're all for non-abusive mothers um, we need to get this balanced out so that every good parent has access and rights to their children now, we've also got the courts. Some of that funding is funneling down through the courts, through the judges, through the, the gals and the CASA workers, which is, um, they are attorneys for the children. They are acting as psychiatrists in these children's cases. They are diagnosing. We've got judges diagnosing. We've got gals and CASA workers diagnosing when they've got some of the time, absolutely no schooling beyond high school. And they certainly don't have mental health degrees. But they are deciding the fate of these innocent children. And 
these parents are putting their trust in the legal system because they were raised to believe that we live in a great country. They were raised to trust our judicial system. And unfortunately, these judges and these court workers have violated every one of Americans' trust. They have destroyed what should be law and justice single-handedly. And that's harming our children. So now I ask you to get involved, volunteer. We can always use volunteers here on the show if, you're, if you would like to come and tell your story, if you would like to um, help the kids and just volunteer your time, whatever you're able to do. We always appreciate our volunteer workers. We've got, to, we've got to write this wrong that's taking place with the children, and we've got to correct this before it becomes a bigger issue. Um, I myself personally lost my son to suicide because of abuse, and I'm not going to see him again. And this was totally unnecessary. And Mine is not an unusual story, and this is a sad part. I wish I could tell you that this was very unusual. It never happens, but right off the top of my head, I can think of about four teenagers that committed suicide in the care of their abusers. This is not going to change, you guys, until we all get angry and stand up and say, we're not going to take this for our children. They deserve better. So my challenge to you is to do something. When you donate clothes, Salvation Army and Goodwill are great places, but much of the time when mothers leave their abusers, they leave with just the clothes on their back and their children. So think about next time you clean out your closets, donate to domestic violence shelters where people have, do not have access, do not have, you know, many of these women are housewives before they leave, so they literally don't have anything. These shelters, they take housing items, they take personal items, just whatever you can do would be helpful for these women who are fleeing. And we need to sort out the court system and stop letting down our children because they deserve our best. So I want to thank you for getting active and becoming involved. The Let's make this a healthier generation and make this a healthier world than we came into. Thank you and have a great day. Well, Maria, back when I got started with the programming, uh, one of our, in fact, four of our first five shows was the Karen, uh, Sharon Cole story. Um, we had Dr. Uh, Carol Kramer do all four of those episodes and um, she interviewed uh, Sharon twice and interviewed two of the children that were involved in this that were now teenagers and we um, kind of blacked out their faces and like that. But there was some very uh, so many things that pointed to the father abusing these children you know, both sexually and everything was done short of a criminal investigation on this. So I guess my question would be is there a threshold in family court to approve anything such as, you know, if CPS, they can take a child on a preponderance of evidence and terminate rights on clear and convincing in divorce court. Is there anything to take the rights from, a, from the father? What, what's involved? Or is it just uh, attorneys and not a whole lot a woman or, or a man can do? Well, Dennis, that's the interesting part because the people they have, you know, as I was saying before, the people that they have decided in these cases have no mental health degrees. They have no, um, nothing that would allow them to prove or disprove 
what the child has been through. They are supposed to rely on the doctor's statements. They are supposed to rely on the, um, it, it, the psychiatrists that have worked with the children that know and that have stated that there is abuse. But a lot of times they're not allowing these doctors to get on the stand. They're not allowing um, the parent that has been abused to bring her evidence into court. And, and by all means, we all know that there are men that are abused too. And, and I found in my time since 2002 of working directly in the courts that the parent who's willing to throw the children under the bus is generally the parent who gets custody. And, you know, I've really tried to think about why this would be, but the way this country is going, the only thing I can think of is that you, if you control the children, you control the future. These children are not taught these days to think for themselves. They're, you can see the change even in the schooling. I see a huge change in the schools to where they're emailing the parents and they're having to tell them how to dress the children. They're telling them, um, you know, basic stuff that should be done at home and this should not even be questioned. And they didn't do this when my older children were in school. They didn't tell the parents how to parent. And, and this, this is what gets me. It's, it's almost, and I felt the same way as a grandparent when CPS stepped in and I, I had no way to protect my grandkids. It's almost like a parent doesn't have any legal way to protect their children from an abuser that has parental rights to a child. So, um, recently in Florida, there was a young lady that didn't appear at a court hearing where her uh, husband was going was to appear on a domestic violence charge and she was con charged with contempt in court and we have that video from uh, one of the television stations down there that we wanted to um, show you the viewer in case you missed it or didn't see it on uh, TV so let's go to where a judge berates a woman for not showing to a court hearing on domestic violence by her husband. Since I hereby enact a contempt hearing, you were to show cause and you may testify as to why the court should not hold you in contempt of court for failing to appear as summoned, which you were duly summoned in this matter, in this case, on Someone was issued in this matter on um, June 19th. You were given notice that you needed to appear today at, um, for trial. And uh, before I proceed further, I went, um, we did have a selected jury for this case. You were notified that you were needed to be here. You, pursuant to testimony, uh, by not testimony, the statements by the assistant state attorney, Mr. Jacob Cole, indicated to the court that you refused to come to court. You noticed to be here. You were contacted. We selected a jury on Monday. You were contacted on Tuesday, and you were told that you were not to be here. And you were indicated to the assistant state attorney that you would not show up. That prior to that week, you had indicated that you were not going to show up knowing that you were under subpoena. Is that correct? So now, you need to tell the court why I should not hold you in contempt of court. The court, and I 
I can sentence you to jail. So tell me why. Your Honor, I'm, I'm very sorry for not attending class. Um, I just, I've been dealing with some depression. And, and just a lot, a lot of personally since, since this happened. And, I just, uh, my anxiety is like, I just, and this is every day for me. Um, it was like, we, we were trying to separate and it's like, just, it's just, things were, I don't know. I just, why didn't you show up to court? I'm just, my anxiety and I'm just. You think you're going to have anxiety now? <laughs> you haven't even seen anxiety. We had a jury, six people there, ready to try Mr. who has a prior criminal history of domestic violence. You were required to be here by a court order. You disobeyed a court order, knowing that this was not going to turn out well for the state. Knowing, is it true what you told the police? Is it true? Those statements you told to the police on the day of this incident, was it true? The incident that happened on April 2nd, was it true? Yes. Then why wouldn't you come to testify? They told me originally, I, I went to the domestic abuse class. I asked them to drop everything. I just, why? I'm trying to move on with my life. Because it's not, it's not just, it's not just a domestic, and this has been, this has been for years, and I'm, I'm just, I tried to move on a couple months ago, and it's, it's just like, I, I don't know, <clears throat> I've, I've moved out, I've tried to move on with my life, and then when I had, I filed for child support last June, and it took them an entire year to find him, I don't understand why, and May 1st, I was supposed to be getting my transport so I can go get an apartment, go get a job and everything. And when he lost, when he was in, when he went to jail for two weeks, he lost his job, he lost everything. And I did, I'm, I'm like homeless now. I'm living at my parents' house. Uh, everything has been shut off. I just sell everything I own. Like, I just... <laughs> I'm just not in a, I'm not in a good place right now. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. Andrew did not do anything for you. I hear by finding you in contempt of court, I sent you to three days in the county jail. <laughs> Turn around. Don't do anything. Please, please. You should have showed up and you should have I'm a one-year-old son, and I'm trying to take care of him by myself. I'm begging you, please, please don't. Please, know, please, please. Order. Please. 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 As I, as I watched the video, Maria, I noticed uh, this woman was scared. She was scared to come to this court hearing and testify against her husband for domestic abuse. And, um, you know, the judge ended up throwing her in jail for contempt. And, you know, um, you as a woman, can you relate to that any? I definitely can, Dennis. Um, this is often the case with domestic violence victims. You are, it's one of the only crimes where the victim is re-victimized over and over and over again. If you do not leave the relationship, CPS will step in and take your children away from you. If you do leave the relationship, family courts will step in and take your children and place them with the abuser. It's really a no-win situation. And this poor woman, you know, it's very common for victims to suffer post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of times, especially with prolonged court hearings, they experience um, the extended uh, PTSD. It's, it just keeps going and it keeps going. And the 
trauma is never ending for these women. Many of them are unable, like disabled as myself was. I had my back broken by my ex-husband in case you do, are not aware of my case, but I was unable to work. And they still to this day have me paying $1,300 a month to my ex-husband. So, you know, and I get 700 in disability. So every month I'm in arrearages. Then, you know, when he feels like it, he takes me to court. And our former judge, who was since taken off our case because I charged him with stalking and harassment through the state police and Michigan State Police and the FBI, he was taken off our case. But now the judge that is in charge of our case is scared of our former judge because he keeps suing her. He sued her all the way to the Supreme Court. So you've got these women trying to do things that are impossible for them to do. This woman on the video, this poor poor woman had anxiety and couldn't show up. And much of the times, especially right after the domestic violence incident, you don't know you're in shock. You don't know you're dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. In my case, that was something that happens on the battlefield. And I didn't go through what a soldier does who sees his whole platoon destroyed and devastated. I mean, it's just, it's not something that's commonly known. And, you know, it's also something that carries a stigma with it. As far as victims go, they have memory loss. They have, you know, different symptoms. And much of the time, as in my case, my children witnessed the incident. So these women are not even thinking about themselves. A lot of times they're trying to help their children heal. So this is really, this is really tough for me to see, but I assure you, this goes on in American courtrooms and across the globe every day with them re-victimizing victims. What a mess we have in this court system. It's a circus. You go down there and that courtroom every day is full and it's just not that courtroom, but the next county over and the next county over and nationwide. It's a big money-making tool for these people. I want to thank each one for tuning in this week. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice makes the, the difference. difference.